Senior Director of Developer Relations at Applitudes. Today I'm going to talk about visual testing with AI, but first I want you to play a little game of who done it with me. Now they don't have the audio, so you got to listen really closely, okay? Maybe I'll put my mic close. <laughs> Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scone below stairs, sir. Well, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. But, but, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Uh, Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Well, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. So, did anyone happen to notice the 21 changes? No. How about the biggest one where the dead man got up and walked away? No? All right. Probably because we all suffer from what's called unintentional blindness. An intentional blindness is where something unexpected comes into our viewport, but we totally missed it because we're so focused on a specific task. This is especially relevant when we talk about testing our code, right? We're so focused on whatever it is that we just developed, we may miss other things that's going on in the application. So we typically solve for this by automating the test because if we automate the test, we know, all right, it's gonna take the same steps every time, it's gonna do the same assertions every time, and I don't have to remember to check all of these things. But what if I told you that by automating your test, you're actually scripting in the unintentional blindness? What? Yes, when we think about the typical automation tools. Someone tell me your test tool you use. Anybody use Cypress? Anybody use Selenium? Jest? Uh, anything else? Who am I missing? WebDriver.io? Okay. You don't test your code? All right. So in any of those solutions, what it's doing is interrogating the DOM, right? for any information you ask for. So if you say, is this text present on the screen? It's going to check the DOM. It's going to say, yes, that text is present on the screen. Anything could be wrong with that text, right? What about if it's the same color as the background and therefore you can't see it or it's covered by some other element or it's bleeding off the edge of the page? There's a million things that could go wrong and our scripts would not catch it. Now, usually when I tell people about visual testing, they'll say something like, oh, that's pretty neat, but yeah, we don't really have a lot of visual bugs. I beg to differ. I've seen a lot of bugs. I've seen the apps that you all are building, and everybody suffers from visual bugs. Once I show them to you, you'll probably notice them more readily as well. So here's an example. This is Cineworld. Cineworld is the second largest cinema chain in the world, really big in Europe, okay? They had a visual bug on the page that asked if you want to store your credit card information. 
Show of hands, who's storing their credit card information here? Two people. Tell us why. Huh? It's easy? What'd you say? Okay. All right. Who would not store their credit card information here? All right. Someone tell me why not. Insecure? How do you know that? Doesn't look trustworthy? Right. The only thing that's wrong here is these labels aren't aligned with the radio button. But we've taken that leap that, oh no, <laughs> this is not a trustworthy app, right? Because what our brain is telling us is if they miss this, they probably didn't test this flow at all, right? So who knows what's going on on the back end of this? And you start losing trust in this app. Think about the conversions here. I'm sure it's close to zero except for my friend in the back, okay? Now, this situation, let's think about our automated test. If we were to automate a test that tests this whole flow, it would pass. The radio buttons are there in the DOM, the labels are there in the DOM. Test is green, and yet we shipped with it. Here's another one, open table. So I went to North Carolina. Anybody here from North Carolina? All right, let's see. What are y'all known for? Food. What food? Barbecue, right? So I used to live there. I went back to visit some friends. I wanted to get up with a lot of people at one time, right? So I went to make reservations for seven people. And my favorite barbecue place there is the pit. So I chose the date. I wanted to choose 7 o'clock. I clicked the 7 o'clock button, and a modal appeared. Now, I was a bit confused because there was nothing centered here in the modal, so I didn't really know what I was supposed to do. And as I started looking around, I noticed in this upper corner here two select buttons. They're not aligned. I don't really even know what I'm selecting. So I did what any of you would do. I opened Chrome DevTools, <laughs> you know, start digging around to figure out what are these buttons. And when I did that, I noticed that the labels were there. They were just as far away from the buttons as possible. So me being the foodie that I am, I completed my reservation, right? But I couldn't help but think of other customers who are not software engineers, who know nothing about Chrome DevTools, who are not digging around in the DOM to make a reservation at your restaurant, right? And if you are a millennial like I am, you aren't calling anybody to make a reservation, gasp. What do you do? You close this, you choose another restaurant or something like that. So I start thinking, man, they gotta be losing a lot of money with this, right? This is seven of us. We were gonna go here, we haven't seen each other in a while, we're gonna buy food and drinks and spend a, a bunch of cash, right? Again, if this was automated, this test passed. The test is able to read in the DOM which one of these buttons is supposed to be clicking, and this gets shipped to Prod as well. Now, these aren't just one-offs that happen to these companies. This happens to your favorite tech companies as well. Y'all ready? I'm about to shoot some shots. Amazon. So this is on uh, mobile view, right? Someone wants to buy a product. Not only do they want to buy a product, they want to increase the quantity, meaning multiplying the amount of money that they want to spend, and they're faced with this. Now, Jeff Bezos, he doesn't need my money, right? But you have enough of these happen, maybe it impacts the bottom line. He can't get coffee tomorrow or something. Facebook, Marketplace. This is where you go to shop. I see this, I don't wanna buy, <laughs> right? The text is going down the, the edge of the page, it's overlapping on the images, it looks really unappealing. If I had automated tests for this, I asked, is this text present, is this text present? Yes, yes, yes. And this is how this is shipped, right? Instagram, this one is my favorite one because this is sponsored content. Meaning someone paid good money to have premium placement on Instagram, and this is what they got. Again, what are our automated tests saying? Yes, the test is present, yeah. 
Ship it, girl. That looks good. And this is how we end up with this, right? I'm sure this company wanted a refund and they probably didn't want to advertise with Instagram anymore. Here is Twitter. You open Twitter, you see this, what you do? You close the app, right? You don't want to be bothered with this. Tweets are overlapping. If we had automated tests, yes, the tweets are there. Everything is there. It's good. Even Google. Now, this one is kind of small, right? Because it's just a little text, all, uh, you know, bleeding off the butt. But this is a point of purchase. So some highly salaried Google engineer has to stop innovating new features to fix something like this. The great news, we don't have to live like this. Visual testing can be automated. So what is visual testing? Visual testing is where you take a screenshot of your application in the state that you approve of, right? You looked at it, everything looks great. And then for every regression run, it'll take another screenshot and compare the two to see if there are any differences. Now, visual testing is not something that's entirely new. It's been around for a little bit, but the older technique we were using as an industry would compare these images pixel by pixel. As you can imagine, this becomes very flaky, right? Not only do browsers on updates kind of render things a little bit different, maybe a little bit more white space or a font change or something like that, but there's also all sorts of other things that we might not naturally think about. For example, in this top picture, this is my golden state. In the second one, this is a regression run. The regression run has failed. Who can see why? The button and what? At the bottom, the button is bolded, right? Okay, well, it just so happens that's the hover effect. Now, again, this is automated software. A human is not involved in this and that's where the cursor happened to be, right? When this picture was taken. And so you have this effect here. The bill fails, everybody's upset. You track it down to something like this, annoying. Here's another one. Who can see what happened here? The cursor in the first video. The cursor in the first one, not in the second one. Cursors blink, people, right? So if you happen to take the picture when the cursor was solid versus when it wasn't, now you also have a pixel difference and your bills are failing. So this is annoying and people got really tired of using this approach and you know it gave visual testing a bad name. Fortunately, Applitools has come out with a much more modern approach that uses machine learning to compare the images. So it's able to detect the changes that we would care about as human beings, okay? So I took a little spot the difference game. You all don't get to play because you let the dead man walk in the first game. But I ran this through pixel to pixel comparison and I ran it through the machine learning comparison because I wanted to see what's the difference in comparison. So when I ran it through the pixel to pixel, notice how sensitive this is. It basically picks up every single thing, like white shift changes, things that we don't even notice, right? Not only that, I can't really make sense of this and what exactly changed. It's a lot of noise for me. I wouldn't want this as part of my build. Now, when I ran it with Applitudes, notice it highlighted the things that we would have highlighted as humans, okay? So, I want to show you how to add this. It works with uh, web apps, mobile apps, uh, components, web components, um, PDF files, standalone images, you name it. So I'm going to show you this um, single page app, very basic, eight of my favorite books on testing. And the way it works is you type in a partial title, full title, whatever, and it will go ahead and show you the books that have that uh, phrase in the title, okay? So here's our Cypress test. Now it works with Cypress, 
selenium, everything that you all raised your hands with, um, also with homemade custom testing frameworks as well, okay? So here's our test, and here we are querying for the word test. We put our expected books inside of this array. So here are the titles that we expect when we search for tests, and then we do some assertions here. So we wanna make sure that the exact number of books that's in the array are the ones that's shown on the screen, and then we're gonna loop through those and make sure that the titles are there for each one, okay? All right, so this is our test, good to go. I'm so proud that we have tests. And I get a little CSS happy, right? Now CSS is not my strong suit. I can do a little bit, I could put me a border, you know, I might could center a div, but I'm not that advanced at it. But I wanna add a little flair to my app. So I go ahead and add this one line of CSS. I have tests. So I can do whatever I want. The test will catch me if I mess up. So I go ahead and I check this in, right? Okay, so again, here's our test. Are we gonna catch anything with this? I don't know, let's see. This is the effect that that one line of CSS had. It literally flipped my application on its head but I have tests. So I run my test and it's great. Again, this is an example of what happens when we use our automated tests as is. They're querying the DOM. Our test asks, are all of these titles present? Technically, yeah, <laughs> they are. Or is it this exact number of books? Yep, sure is. Ship it. Right? So let's change this to add some visual. Now, this is it. It's very simple. It's pretty much poetry. It's three commands. We say, open your eyes. Right? And this API integrates with Cypress, so it's really nice. You can just use side dot. Open your eyes. Then we say, go ahead and check the window. That is what does the magic. So on that check window, it's going to take the screenshot. If this is the, it takes the screenshot, it sends it up to the Applitude Cloud. If this is the very first time that the test is run, it's gonna automatically save that as your baseline. You don't have to do anything else here, right? Um, if it is a regression run, it's going to find the baseline from before, and it's going to compare it to see if there are any differences, okay? And once you said check window, the final command is close your eyes, we're done here. Very cute. Okay, so when we run this visual test, notice here that we do indeed get the differences. Our test has failed, and it has shown us exactly what's wrong here. Now this dashboard is very, very neat. Not only will it highlight the differences, there's root cause analysis here. So I can say, show me exactly what changed in my code. And it will show me that one line of CSS that caused this problem. So not only do I know it's broken, I know why, okay? Let's talk about some pros and cons of visual testing, because I don't want to just sell you a pipe dream. Let's discuss. Pros, anyone? They're catching UX issues before they ship, something that we wouldn't have been able to catch with our traditional testing tools, right? Anything else here? That inintentional blindness is gone, right? Because not only is it checking that, if anything else on this page was wrong, a pink elephant flew across it or something, it's gonna check all of that stuff as well because it's an image, right? So we have more coverage. Anything else? What, huh? The pattern library catches the butterfly effect when it has it somewhere, it doesn't break the button somewhere else. Ah, y'all heard that? Say it again, how? Butterfly effects, if I change the padding on 
some list somewhere. I know that that class is used on a button somewhere else that I'm not working on embracing. So it's progression. Okay. Anything else? What about the, the amount of code? Hmm? A lot less code, right? So before I had to explicitly define my test data. Um, I had like all of these assertions and stuff. And so I was able to get rid of that and essentially just use the three lines of code. So I have less code and more coverage, right? Anything else? What about some cons? Y'all are being too nice. You've got to define your success case by having it already run. You have to define your success case by having already run, right? So when you run it that first time, it's going to store that as your success case unless you specify that it's not, right? So that's true, but I would argue I got to do that too, even without visual testing, right? The very first time I write a test, I have to be a little bit more thorough to make sure that that test actually was written properly and it passed when it's supposed to pass, it failed when it's supposed to fail. Y'all make sure y'all do that. That's a free tip. That's nothing to do with this talk. But when you write your test, make sure you see it fail so you know it's not lying to you. Okay? Any other cons? Yeah. I feel like it might make intentional changes with non-intentional changes on the same report. So it might mix intentional changes with non-intentional changes all in the same report, right? And that's true. So let's say we want the books upside down. That was an intended effect. Feature not above, right? In this case, it is going to fail, but it's going to be yellow. It's going to say unresolved, right? And that's what I like because people ask me sometimes, is AI going to like take our job? And this is a great example of how AI can assist us in our development versus taking over. So this is going to say, hey, human overlord, I noticed a difference. I'm not sure if this is intentional or not. Can you please review it? and say yes or no. Um, you can't see in these pictures, but there's a thumbs up and a thumbs down button. So if this was intentional, I press thumbs up. If it's unintentional, I press thumbs down and it'll fail, okay? Any other cons? Yeah. Animations, okay, good question. So because it's taking a, a picture, of this, it's not going to verify your animations. In fact, if you know it's a different uh, frame in the pictures, that's going to fail, right? This tool is so flexible though, it allows you to ignore certain regions or even do different types of comparisons on it. So by default, it's doing a strict comparison, meaning this should match, right? Um, I could say something like, on the animation portion of this image, I want you to just verify that something is there. I don't need you to go into the detail of what it is, make sure it's not empty or something like that, or I can ignore it altogether. So I use ignore a lot for um, things like ads on the page, timestamps, things that are going to be very dynamic. Uh, I'll just say ignore that. And that's pretty cool because I can mix and match on the same image. Any other cons or pros? All right. So one pro that is also a con, when we remove that inintentional blindness here, we're covering everything. Now, for this specific test, what do I care about? I only care that those books filter down to what I needed. What if the title changed on this page? That would get flagged as well. I don't necessarily care about that in this test. So like I said, it's flexible. Not only can you mix and match, but you can also scope your image down to specific regions on the page. So here, for example, I say search for agile testing. I'm only expecting one book back. I say, here's the ID of that book. Go ahead and only take a picture of that book. Don't take a picture of the entire page. And when I do that, this is what that image would look like. Okay? Pros and cons. 
If they change the price of the book, then you won't have control of that, right? Based on what I've said already in this talk, can anyone say how you might get around that? Yeah, so you could say ignore the price or there's another piece I'm going to show you in a minute, but you can say this is dynamic content. I don't know what it's going to be. Sometimes we have sales. Sometimes they, you know, mark the price up. Make sure it follows this format, right? Don't worry about what the numbers say specifically. What else? True of everything, really. So the image itself is a thumbnail. I expect this thumbnail to be the same every time, I think. If it changes, I want to know that. Would you agree? OK. So, if, so I guess you could program what you want to be dynamic and um, so that the test won't, you won't have to keep updating the test over and over and over again, right? Yeah, so you can add these annotations on here either programmatically or you can do it in the dashboard. I like to do it programmatically um, because if I do it on the dashboard, I'm saying this, these X and Y coordinates essentially, right? And so if, let's say the price, if I put a, a little rectangle around that 49.09, and then let's say the price was $4,900.09, that would span across and I would no longer be in the region of that X and Y that I drew. Versus if I do it programmatically, like something like this, except you could say ignore and give the selector. If I did something like that, then it would find that element. And no matter what the dimensions were on that element, it'll ignore that for me, okay? Can you take the image you got previously, the book cover, will this catch if it is accidentally replaced with a lower resolution asset. So, ah. so if the image for this is replaced with a lower resolution asset accidentally, so maybe you got somebody grabbed a screenshot and replaced it without meaning to, will it still catch that error or does it see it as effectively the same? It's assuming it's an AI. That's a good question. I don't know. Um, I've, I've not run that before. That's a really good question. Now I gotta go play with that. And then I would imagine, like, the difference of the resolution matters too, right? So if it's slightly degraded, maybe not. Um, but if it's a big, drag difference where the colors are muted and things like that, probably so. Oh, yeah. So different size, it'll definitely catch that. I mean, like, the, you're checking a big rectangle size that you accidentally plug in a thumbnail on the previous. Oh, yeah, it'll catch that for sure. Yeah, it'll definitely catch that. Okay. Any other pros and cons on the scoped element? So there's one you're missing, right? Let's go back to that unintentional blindness. So let's say that I search my app for agile testing. One element is supposed to be shown, this one. But the filter is totally broken. So no books were filtered away. Is this test going to pass or fail? How many say pass? How many say fail? How many are waiting on the edge of their seat? OK, I was asked to repeat the question. Let's go back a few slides. With the tools? With the tools. With the tools. So you got everything in place. You got your visual testing in place, everything. So instead of test there, let's say I put in agile testing, right? And I expect just that one book, that third book to be shown. But Filter is totally broken, so all eight books are there. I've told the visual testing tool to verify that book. I gave it the locator. 
Is my test going to pass or is it going to fail? Okay. So let's ask again. How many say the test will pass? Yeah, test I just ran. How many say it's going to fail? It should pass because you didn't give it like x y coordinates, so it's not like expecting it at a certain, certain position on the page. So it should pass, right? So you say pass, okay? Just, just a kind of okay. This is it. This is what I mean. So I put test in, and nothing went away, right? If I run that same test, it's going to pass because it looked for that book. It said, visually, this looks amazing, right? It looks just like the last time you asked me. We put the unintentional blindness back in where it's not looking around. It's, we told it to focus only on this one thing, right? So you end up missing if there's any other consequences or things like that, right? So that's the thing too. Again, is AI gonna take our job? We're the engineers, we still have to think, right? I had to give you this puzzle, testing puzzle, and we all were like kind of scratching our heads trying to figure out what was gonna happen. And you still have to <laughs> be the engineer, right? You still have to think through this. If I scope something down, what am I missing, right? So you can still scope it down, but you have to be a bit more thorough in your test. So for example, I would add another assertion here. So I'm mixing a functional assertion with the visual assertion. So I say, go ahead and make sure there's only one book visible. And then once we verify that, then take the picture and make sure visually it looks okay, right? So that's one approach. Another approach, if you just want to keep it visual, you wouldn't even need that assertion. You could change the selector from just the book to the entire results area, maybe. Okay. Questions on that? Does that make yeah? Does so your skill bit also act as an assertion? So we can't find that selector as it would scale. Oh, uh, yes. So if it can't find a selector, say I don't I don't know this element. Yeah. Any other questions? Was this part clear? Okay, all right, nice. Okay, now let's talk about dynamic. So people will ask me about that. Well, surely I can't use this, right? Your brains already went there. What about if the price change? What about if this and that, right? So there's four different match levels you can use with Applitude. The default one was strict. That's the one we've been using so far. You can also say, just verify the content. So that ignores color changes. So if you wanted to do like dark mode or light mode, or if you wanted to um, have like custom user custom colors or something like that, you can say, look, I don't know what the color is gonna be. Don't worry about that. Only verify the content of the application. So that's pretty handy. And then um, there's also exact, which does pixel to pixel. I already told you all, Pixel to pixel is not your friend. Don't use that mode, okay? And then this mode is layout. So layout is for the dynamic content. Machine, work, machine learning works a little bit different in this context in that it looks at the page and it determines what's the pattern of the page. What's the structure there, right? And for example, we have Eight books here, so it'll probably say, okay, there's some squares. It looks like there's some purple uh, rectangle in the upper right corner, a, a big image, uh, bolded text, followed by not bolded text, that sort of thing. And it makes sure that structurally your page follows this pattern. If anything was overlapped or anything like that, it would catch that. So this is popular for like new sites, um, when I worked at Twitter, we used this mode. We don't know what the tweets will say, but we know it should have a certain anatomy, right? Now, notice this one. This test has passed even though I switched the order of the book because I told it, just make sure that the layout of the page is visually correct. I don't need you to look at the content of it, okay? Pros and cons. So, would it... 
check it, like if there was a, a cucumber for a Java book, if that didn't have that image there, since you're just checking the anatomy of it, would it still pass? Does it have any image or a different one? If it's no image, say that that's like just black or it's an X or something like that, it'll catch that, right? Because that doesn't match the pattern. Well, to that point though, in the cucumber for Java, if the image is, it is a proper image, but it is simply black field, that still has its layout, or does it expect there to be some kind of some variation there? So, uh, so if the algorithm is looking at this pattern and says, like, all of them have some sort of image here and one does not, it should pick that up. Anything else? Pros, cons? Okay, image is for the wrong book. So it instead of cucumber for Java, it said, you know, the hobbit. Even though it says cucumber for Java in the, like, the title of the book. Yes. Does that pass or fail? That would pass. So if when I switch the order of these books, I mess something up, I put the wrong image on the wrong book, I put the wrong author or something like that, that will pass because it still matches the structure of the page, right? So that is definitely a con. You would miss any bugs because you're not looking at the content, only the structure, right? So I don't recommend using this for like your end all be all, right? So I have some teams and they're like, yeah, just slap dynamic on everything. Don't do that. <laughs> so I use this for like um, my smoke test, for example. So I just want to make sure the app is up and running. It looks okay. And then I get into more detailed testing. Um, I also sometimes use it for if I'm doing API testing. So I'm gonna test everything on the back end, all the data, and then I just wanna make sure when it's displayed, it looks okay, right? Um, so that sort of thing. I don't use it very frequently. Any questions about the dynamic content? All right, cool. For what? Right, and the page dynamically loads, um, I have pagination on. Would it catch that? Say it again. So you have pagination and what's going on? Uh, I have a I have a spot and maybe maybe uh, would it it takes the image and, and the page changes. Would it catch that or more information load and it'll load more at the end once you scroll? Great question. So he has a single page app. Um you have to scroll to get some more data. It loads as you scroll, right? Infinite scroll or something like that. And he wants to know what happens in this case. That's an excellent question. By default, with the code that I've shown you, this is going to take a picture of the page as it is. It's not gonna do scrolling. If you want scrolling, then you add another parameter to that check window call to say scroll, basically. And what it'll do is it'll take a picture of this, it's gonna scroll, it's gonna take a picture of the rest, scroll, take another picture, and then stitch all of those pictures together to make one image. Okay, questions on that? Good question. Will it have to be the same screen size every time it runs? So, we all know, if we change these screen sizes, things are different, right? Um, it might be three books on a row with a smaller screen, or it might be a single column if we're talking about mobile view, right? So what Amplitude is gonna do, it uses a bunch of criteria to determine the uh, unique identifier for a test. The name of the test, the browser that it's running against, the, uh, or device, the resolution of that, um, and one more thing, the operating system, I think. So if you run this test again, but you change the size of the window, it's not going to fail. It's going to create a new test with that new size. And then anytime you run, it's going to look, do you already have a test in these, you know, with this browser, these dimensions? It'll use that as your baseline. If not, it'll create a new one, right? 
Any other questions? All right. Okay, so not only do we get to run the visual test on our local system, we can run across multiple browsers and devices. How many people in here do cross-platform testing? All right, about five folks. What's the rest of y'all doing? Testing on Chrome and calling it a day? <laughs> no judgment. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I heard in uh, the last talk I was in, they were like, yeah, Safari is the new IE. Any Apple people in here? I'm going to step on y'all turn. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, brethren. <laughs> but um, yeah, I found some pretty nasty things happen on things like, you know, uh, Safari or all of that, right? So some of these share like a common thing, right? So, you know. Edge and, and Chrome, you know, Chromium type browsers. But for a lot of them, they might be different. But not only that, not only the browsers. You got to think about these mobile viewports as well, right? I promise you, this is where I find most of the visual bugs. When you start changing screen sizes and stuff like that, things get wonky. So the way that this works is pretty neat. You run it just locally. I don't need all of these devices. I don't need to install all of these browsers or anything like that. I write my test just as I'm writing it locally. Maybe I'm running it on Chrome or something like that. It's going to run that test at the point that you say check window. It's going to grab the state of your application, meaning your HTML, your JavaScript, your CSS, all of that stuff. And then it's going to blast that state across all of the configurations that you've specified, right? So if I want to run against Chrome, Edge, um, Safari, IE, I want to run against iPhone uh, 10 and 11, I want to run against uh, Android and Portrait and Landscape, I can just specify all of those in an array of objects, and it'll run this, right? And notice, it's not within my test. So I don't have to put this in every single test. I put it in my before, and then every visual test that I run is going to do that. And then it'll add those entries into my, um, my dashboard. So it'll look something like this. You have all of these different screen sizes going. It takes a picture of each one of those. It adds it to the dashboard. Notice there, it shows the devices that it was run against. So if there were any issues on, you know, mobile or something like that, you can catch those with this. And it runs lightning fast. It runs all of these things in parallel, and it doesn't have to execute the steps. I think that's a key point that I love a lot because it's grabbing the state, right? I'm not really testing the execution of this, I'm testing like once I get it into a certain state, what does it look like, right? And so you bypass all of the execution, say like you needed to set up a new user, a profile, all of this stuff is going on in your test. When you run across all of these configurations, you just get to the good part and make sure it looks okay. I saw a question. I was going to ask, I mean, since you're doing this cloud-based um, for like the iOS test, are you running a simulator, like an actual iOS simulator? It's running in Chrome in the, um, what's it called, the device simulator? Yeah, right. So it's using those, so you get the same pixel density and stuff like that, you get the same dimensions. So it's really, really close. It's not using a real device. Yeah, so you can add like a custom situation, right? So you can say, I want this pixel density, I want this size or whatever. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. So yeah, this is cool. There's some, uh, one developer wrote a blog post basically saying like how he ran 100 UI tests in like 10 seconds or something like that. So it's wicked fast. Also works for web components. Anybody use Storybook? Nice. All right. So, 
you know, if there's a problem with any of your components, that gets propagated everywhere that the component is used in the application. You don't want to find it by time that happens, right? So you can run the visual test on the components itself. That's the command. It's very simple in PXI's storybook. And this is how that'll work. It essentially render your components onto um, using Puppeteer onto like a browser or something. And if you, you can also specify um, that you want to run this across the grid. So you can specify all your configurations as well, and then you can see how your components display in all of these configurations. Pretty neat stuff. Okay. Any questions on Storybook? All right. So that is visual testing in a nutshell. Do you have any burning questions, concerns, anything that I can answer? How do I manage all of those baselines? So because it's in the dashboard, I don't have to really do much of anything. It's managing that. Now, this everything I showed you is available in the free account of Applet Tools. If you wanted to run like on premise or something like that, that is an upgrade. So we have some customers that are banks, medical fields, stuff like that, where they can't run in the cloud. So they run it locally. And in that case, like your images and stuff are stored locally. But other than that, if you're using like the free account or you're using the, even an upgrade account with the, the cloud, um, it's a private cloud, but, or a secure cloud, I should say. But um, all of that management is done up there. There's also ability to uh, do more management on like the versions of your baseline. So say, for example, um, you want to revert back to a certain point, you can do that. You can see like, how your app has changed over time, those sorts of things. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you're testing an app with a lot of data. Do you typically focus on uh, test data management more, or do you reverse to like, the layout? No. This is what I love. So if I have a lot of data, before I would have to put all of that data in my code base somewhere, right? Now I have this stored in images, so I don't have to maintain that at all. And so notice in that one test I showed you, we got rid of that array that had like the five book, uh, that was my test data, right? All of those titles. I could get rid of that type of stuff. I don't have to worry with that anymore because the image, I like to say, um, it's worth a thousand assertions. So it's keeping that data for me and I don't have to worry with it. But for the images to be the same, the data... For the images to be the same, the data needs to be the same. And that's if you're doing visual testing or not, right? Test data management is one of the hardest problems in testing because as this data starts changing, whether we do visual or not, our test is expecting certain data and if it's different, it fails, right? So this helps alleviate some of that. I don't have to worry about it. But again, if your data is changing, then yes, it is going to fail, right? So you could do some sort of masking, like you could say, um, only verify, you know, dynamically or, or whatever if you wanted to. But I mean, I don't recommend that. <laughs> I recommend you stabilize your data. Any other questions? Practice, do you find yourself updating a lot of screenshots and as you do anything else? No. So, in practice, it's pretty stable unless your app is constantly changing, right? Um, so, for things that are constantly, like say you have a page and that's under development, whatever pieces are not stable, I ignore those parts and I focus my test on what I need to focus on, right? Um, once that test becomes more, I mean, that page becomes more stable, we're not touching it as much anymore, then I might broaden that out to do the whole page. So it sounds like, I know for our purposes, we, we do a lot of collaboration when we work together, so we, we have a designer and we're coding right with them. So like, we want to have something we're pushing, and then 
but we later we changed it right again. So right. it sounds like for this, it would be better to just wait for a while before it's stable. Yeah, I would wait till it's stable. Yeah, I wait till it's stable. Um, and I don't put visual checks on everything, right? Just like any other tool, it has its purpose. It has cases where it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So I add them to the ones where it makes sense, right? So in practice, how much time does this actually save you in your, in your normal workflow? My marketing team has all sorts of numbers. I'm not on marketing, so I don't, <laughs> I don't know. But they have like, oh, this saves you X amount of time, blah, blah, blah. I don't know those numbers, right? I don't spout those. But I know it saves me a lot of development time. I hate having to deal with selectors and all of that kind of stuff and my assertions. Not only that, let me take you through a scenario. So let's say we have an e-commerce site and we want to add a product to a shopping cart and we want to test that. So my immediate thought is, I'm going to make sure that this product is in the cart. How do I do that? Maybe with the name of the product. Same thing with the books. What do we make sure that the title of the book was there? What about the price? What about the thumbnail? What about the authors? None of that was in our original test and we felt good about that. Same with like a shopping cart. What about the tax? What about the subtotal? What about the quantity? What about the final total? Is there anything else that's in this, um, in this cart, right? None of that we test because subconsciously when we're looking at it, we see all of that stuff, but when we write our scripts, we write one lazy assertion, right? That's not covering the whole gambit. So when you use this visual testing part, now I have all of that covered, even the assertions that I didn't think about explicitly. So it saves me a whole bunch of time. One, the thought of what else, what other assertions do I need to add, right? Um, it saves me from having to code all of those assertions, because then I now need to get the identifiers for all of those things that I just listed, right? That's a pain. Um, and then I don't have to add this code. Cool. And you mentioned that the, uh, that the results of the comparison will point you to the line of code. That's, uh, how did you map that? So it keeps um, a history of the DOM as well as the images, right? Um, the DOM and the CSS, right? So given that you had this explicit change, it can detect like what changed in the DOM and kind of map those two, right? So you do have, it knows like based on this image, maybe this was the locator of that thing and it could find that in the DOM and kind of find the relative code around it. Yes. Do you have PR integration so if my visual test fail, it will block merge and then I can like link that out to the UNC to make Yeah, so it does um, integrate with like GitHub and GitLab, stuff like that. Also integrates with like your communication system. So if you want it on failure, it can put the screenshot in a Slack channel where people can check, you can do stuff like that too. Um, I think we just added support for Microsoft Teams, and then it also works with email. Anything else? All right, you all have been great. Thank you so much.